I recently did an interview on TikTok Live with two ex-Catholics now turned Protestant. What you're about to see is their testimony and the beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church. Let me know what you think and go follow me on TikTok. Right, so Megan, you want to you go first and just give your testimony about uh, your experience and why you left and yeah, just go for it. Sure. So hi, I'm Megan. I grew up in New Orleans. I grew up very devout Catholic. Um, I was in Catholic school my entire life from the age of three all the way through high school. I went to the same high school as Amy Coney Barrett, the new Supreme Court Justice, oh, wow. uh, St. Mary's High School, very prestigious Catholic high school. I was fully catechized, you know, baptism, uh, first confession, first communion, and, and eventually confirmation. Um, I even thought about becoming a nun because I've always loved mm -hmm. God and I've always served in church, even as a Catholic. I would sing the Psalms for mass. And like I said, being an altar server, you know, I was actually the first girl in my church to serve midnight mass for Christmas. Oh, okay. um, one of the guys, did, yeah, one of the guys didn't show up and I was like a young teenager at the time, but I was five, eight and I was wearing heels. So normally they'd have the high school boys do it, but some guy didn't show up. They're like, <laughs> Megan, she's tall enough. So yeah, we were very devoted Catholic. And uh, when I went to college, I kind of got out of church, started living that party lifestyle. I was on the rowing team. Like I went to regattas regularly on the weekend, so I wasn't in church. Uh, just got really depressed. Just obviously, I, you know, just lost. I mean, I was lost. And um, some Christians were on my campus soul winning, some college students actually. So I was at Northwestern University in Chicago. I was mm -hmm. a journalism student. I was gonna be a sportscaster. I know, it's weird, right? But uh, <laughs> I love sports, love sports, love football, and I love tennis. So that was like my goal. Um, so I was in Chicago when some Christian college students were sewing on my campus and invited me to church. And the girl who witnessed to me, her name was Elise, and she she showed me from the Bible how I could know for sure I was going to heaven because we went to mass every week, every single week. Right. Um, you know, this we were we were in it, but I had no clue the Bible said we could know for sure we were going to heaven. So when she showed me first John five thirteen, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. I had I was shocked. I, I honestly was shocked because I was raised to believe the Bible was God's word. So I believed what she was showing me was true. And then she showed me Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, where it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yeah. So not only could I know I was going to heaven, but it had nothing to do with who I was or what I did. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what? <laughs> so I felt very lied to, very angry, um, because I loved God. I was sincere. I wanted to live for God. I just decided I liked boys more. And so I didn't go the nun route. But really, I wanted to live for God. And I just was never told, not one time in my entire life. I had the Eucharistic prayer memorized. Like I could have been the priest doing the mass. That's how, you know, it's the same over and over and over again. Right. And I went Sunday my whole life. So, I mean, I knew the stuff, but I didn't have salvation. And ultimately that's the most important thing. And so that's my heart for every Catholic person I meet because they are sincere people generally who love God, who believe the Bible is God's word. They just have not been shown the truth of the scripture. And so that's why I'm here today. Just, we can find one person who has never heard those verses before, but yep. believes the Bible, God's word, believes Jesus is God's son who died on a cross, shed his blood, and rose again on the third day to pay the price for their sins, um, that they could know for sure they have a home in heaven. They don't have to live in fear. They don't have to worry about being a good little Christian. You know, it's not about that. It's about putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And yes, God transforms us. God makes us new creatures. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are come new, become new. But, you know... It's just, it's such a wonderful life, having that peace and that hope and that joy and not having to live in fear. God, for God has not given us a yeah. spirit of fear, right? But of power and of love right. and of a sound. And I didn't have that before salvation. And so, like I said, that's just why I'm here today to share that with the people on the live. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Like there's, yeah, there's a lot of Catholics that, you know, they aren't like super into it. Like, um, you know, just, just like, kind of like you were. And they don't they don't know that 
what like what the Bible actually says. They just go, well, my priest says to do this and this, and as we can get more into that, but like right. there there really is no assurance of salvation at all. I, not a thing my entire life. I had no clue. You could know. No clue. Right. Um, so I guess Nicole, if you want to go ahead and share your testimony. Um, yeah, one second. I'm sorry. There is some weird echoing going on, and I don't know if I logged in correctly. Do I need to disconnect? Echoing, like... Uh, yeah, it's like I'm talking, and then it's talking again. Yeah, I don't hear it, so it's probably her. Um, just yeah, it's on might... my side, so do I need to... Yeah, just... I don't know what to do. Here, I, I can just disconnect you, and then you request again. Okay close out the whole app though like for me when it happens i have to get totally out of tiktok and then come back mm. in um because it's just something yeah. wrong with the way the app started or something yeah i tried to turn my volume down a little bit but it that usually doesn't uh cause an issue uh, i'll turn mine down too <clears throat> that's fine okay uh here we go i did say one thing though while she's gone if that's okay you know, yeah. the reason I never heard is because the church controls what parts of the Bible you hear, right? And I'm sure we'll get into that later, but she's already back. She was fast, so. Yeah. Teaser trailer right. for later. Okay, so much better. That was weird. I'm sorry okay. about that, guys. Awesome. It's okay. Um, it was nice to meet you, Megan, by the way. Um, nice to meet fellow you, Fellow ex-Catholic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my testimony. Okay. Um, born and raised in a Catholic church uh, in Michigan. Um, did the baptism as a baby, did the first communion, did the reconciliation, did the confirmation. Uh, we did the religion classes on Wednesdays called CCD, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Never was introduced to the Bible, at least in my church. Like there was no encouragement to read the Bible, nothing. And uh, the first time I actually did pick up the Bible and read it, was I think it was like eighth grade or something CCD and it was boys and girls they were split up and I started looking at it and it was like I don't know what I'm looking at right now first you have a name right and then you have big numbers and small numbers and I didn't know what I where to even start and I could hear the girl snickering behind me like oh my gosh she's so dumb she doesn't even know how to read the bible Okay, like, you're not even like encouraged in church to read the Bible. So the Bible is completely yeah. foreign to me. Um, but after we moved to Texas in 2008, I just gave up on God entirely, because I didn't see the point. I didn't see the point in church. There was just nothing, nothing there. I didn't get anything out of it. And then I got really depressed after moving away from my friends from childhood and like being in a strange environment, big school, didn't know a single soul. And then I was introduced to a non-denominational church, which I'm like, uh, what is, what, what is that? Like, uh, I asked the person, I'm like, when's mass? <laughs> like, it's called services. It's not mass. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so um, that's when I fully was introduced to a relationship with Jesus. Um, to be honest, Amen. when I was in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. I didn't even know that Jesus and God were the same. Like, oh, really? No idea. Yeah, that was not even. I just wow. knew God sent His Son to die on the cross. That was it. That was. <laughs> that was it. So yeah, I was introduced to non non to name non-denominational church and um I thought I was saved that was in 2009 I was 16 years old and I thought I was saved but I really wasn't um I was introduced to the fact you know that uh Jesus is God and that I could have a relationship with him so I, I was introduced in the knowledge aspect but not the faith aspect right so 2020 is when right. I was really really changed radically my parents will attest to that like I don't curse like a sailor anymore and I don't drink and sleep around and all this. And Halloween was my favorite holiday. And I know it's just crazy what the Holy Spirit has done in such a short amount of time. 
but yeah um Amen. i guess that's my testimony there yeah that is, that's awesome um that that surprised me that uh, you didn't even know jesus and god was the same thing yeah like did did you like not hear that where you, you grew up like in your catholic church no i it didn't even like cross my mind or even like come to like to ask the question like it just no it just wow. yeah they didn't talk about it they didn't say anything about it and yeah so i was i definitely have some grudges i guess you could say against the catholic church when the catholic church the topic of the catholics whatever it comes up i i get pretty testy i get <laughs> like uh let's not go there yeah and the church no, i go I to that. now calvary chapel of mckinney um there are so many people who used to be catholics and it's like mm. the same testimony from them too like they are needing something they were lost they yeah. were just hungry and yeah i get that yeah, yeah it's, so it's crazy. Real fast for all the for all the people freaking out in the chat yes the catholic church does teach the trinity they teach that jesus is god but you yeah. know for the casual mm. observer person like did you grow up in catholic school no probably okay so if you're just going to church right like and you get catechized as a little kid so and they don't care if you actually learn it you like go through it and as long as you can sort of say the ten commandments like they'll pass you through so it's not surprising that she didn't know because well, anyway, we'll talk about that later, that the church is in control of what portions of the Bible. And yes, you do say the creed every mass, but a lot of people don't pay attention or they have no clue what they're saying. Like they don't get it. And so it's mm -hmm. totally normal for her to feel like have felt that way because a lot of people I run into feel that way from their it's upbringing. It's so ritualistic though, you know, it's just sit down, kneel, stand up, sit down, kneel, <laughs> stand up. <laughs> Stay awake, uh, pass out before lady in front of you put on too much perfume and there's no ventilation in the building oh my <laughs> gosh right yeah oh wow yeah that's um that's that's really interesting i i have noticed that um with with just like the catholic people that i know or like their family is catholic they go um it's it's about well you know i can do whatever i want i can go party saturday night and go to mass on sunday get forgiven Mm -hmm. and i'm good to go and that's that's all they ever they ever that's like the deepest they ever get into it yeah and they, they think they they can just go and live whatever life they want come to church on sunday and you're good to go until the next sunday um which was just like whenever i kind of figured it out i'm like first of all why would why would you do that um that's and like <clears throat> the the Eucharist and everything. When I when I figured that out, it's really um, like they they are representing Jesus over again, so he yeah. can like uh, pay for your sins again. But like I, I thought he already did that. Like that's he he made one sacrifice once and for all. Um, it should be done. He said it is finished on the cross. And why do we keep keep doing this? And I think and it's, it's I'm really sure, I'm sure you do, Jordan. You know the Greek word for that? The for, for what for it is finished. Uh to tell us die, I think. Yeah. Um Yeah. It means paid in full. It was like a business term, yeah. right? Like the mm -hmm. debt was fully paid. It was taken care of. There was nothing else that needed to be done. So right. And that that is, it's it's leading people to a, a very scary place because they, they're they're going back to church every Sunday. They think they're they're good to go, but they're really not. They're they're really still lost. Mm -hmm. um, the the Eucharist cannot save you. You're just going there. You, you know, confess your your sins to a priest. Uh, and the the really crazy thing when I found this out. I, blew my mind if you deliberately uh miss mass then that's a mortal sin you're not saved anymore i, I didn't like, know that are you kidding me 
Wow. There, yeah. Over Man, the last year, I mean, I've been learning a lot. And it's wild. Yeah, I just did a podcast talking with Stephen Stoll about Catholicism because I was an ex-Catholic who got saved. And then I was talking with somebody who used to be a Pentecostal that was converting to Catholicism. So that was an interesting discussion, but I have this like whole thing all in my mind after studying it out and writing it down. I mean, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the Eucharist? Do you want to start with mortal versus venial sins? Like, what do you want to start with? Like, <laughs> it's crazy. Oh man. And don't even get me started on, on Mary. I mean, the, just this week I was doing a, like a deeper study on the, the Marian dogmas. And, um, like, where do you even get this stuff? Like, yeah, uh, my brother. That she was wife. sinless. Yeah. Um, that she remained a virgin her whole life, even though the Bible says Jesus has brothers and sisters. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I know it, it comes from the church fathers and everything, but um, and then not even, not even. Like, well, I mean, the, like later, the Roman Catholic they, they Church puts out, out this propaganda. They put out this propaganda that all the church fathers thought exactly the same. I yeah. have this entire database that was sent to me of excerpts and quotes from the church fathers that talk about sola scriptura, that talk about pastors should be elected by the church body. They did not believe in apostolic succession. I mean, we have ample evidence from the church fathers that goes against Roman Catholic practice and doctrine. Um, so it's it's literally propaganda. They were in charge of the narrative because they were the political force of yeah. of the known world. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and even like, which one was it? I think the perpetual virginity came, it developed over time, and it really came from Gnostic writings. And I, I'm, I'm thinking that's where they. They got a lot of their their stuff, their weird Mary stuff. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of church fathers that go directly against Roman Catholic teachings, like uh, Clement of Rome. I was just reading his uh, letter to the Corinthians, and he talks about justification by faith alone, and it's not by you know godliness, works, you know whatever. It's, by faith alone um so they, right. they hebrews, really uh, i'm not hebrews 12 uh, hebrews 10, um it's one of my favorite chapters for eternal security of the believer because what catholics mm -hmm. don't understand is that justification is a one-time event that is forever right it is because jesus was crucified once our salvation or being born again happen happens once you're born physically right born of the water and born of spirit right and being yeah. born of spirit is being born again, regenerated, right? At the moment of salvation. But Hebrews 10 is so clear that he has perfected us by a sacrifice once for all. And it says the mm -hmm. word forever, like four times. Um, and so then they go to James 2. But what they don't understand about James 2 is that it's literally talking about from the perspective of other men. Other men will look at us and say, you know, oh, you say you're saved, but you're not living it out. Like, your faith is dead. It's ineffective. Right. It's not doing anything mm -hmm. for you. And it's not evident to me that you're saved. Like we knew that Abraham was saved by his faith because he was willing to put his faith in God, even if it meant, you know, having to sacrifice his son and all these other things. But there are so many scriptures that talk about Abraham was justified by faith before he was circumcised. And, um, you know, David was justified by faith and Joseph and all of these people and Sarah. And anyway, so it's just, it's just really clear. And it's sad that They've been brainwashed and indoctrinated into this idea that if you don't cooperate with God's grace, like we could cooperate with God's grace. Like, are you serious? We yeah. have to cooperate with God in order to maintain the salvation that he paid for on the cross. Like, how prideful does that sound? You know what I'm saying? Like, that right. sounds ridiculous. Pride is like the biggest thing about a Catholic church. I swear, talking to my brother's wife, I just can't her heart and head is both hard because she thinks mary is in revelation when talking about the woman mary's yeah. everywhere in the bible to her and it's like no i'm sorry that's that's not mary that's talking about israel you don't yeah. know what you're talking about okay and she's like you can't take the bible word for word you can't take it seriously i'm like it's the word of god what do you mean i can't take it seriously hello yeah 
every oh. every time I I talk to a Catholic, like, well, it's a lot in my comments. They cannot give me a Marian dogma using exegesis of scripture. Everything they pull out of there is eisegesis, like reading her into the woman in Revelation, or they go back to Genesis 3, or I, I forget, the, like there's there's a lot of pictures of Mary um, that aren't really pictures of Mary. They just, they they go into reading the Bible with the thought that, oh, this is Mary because the Catholic Church tells me th that this is Mary. They don't even want to exegete the scripture for themselves they they come in with this belief already like all of the mary stuff and i don't i don't even know how you i don't, it's hard to wrap my mind around how you believe this stuff when the bible's right here you can read it and it doesn't have any of that stuff in there mm -hmm. well jesus in his own words said search this in the in the gospel of john search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The only scriptures they had at that point were the Old Testament. So even yeah. if a Christian only had the Old Testament, they could still get the gospel message and what salvation was. And yeah. it's by faith in the Messiah, calling upon the name of the Lord. You go back to Genesis mm -hmm. and Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve, right? It, when he was born, the Bible says, and then man be men began calling upon the name of the Lord. People have been calling upon the name of the Lord for salvation since the very beginning. Um, since the very first people ever existed, the gospel has been the same forever. It wasn't a different gospel in the Old Testament. <clears throat> we knew of the Messiah from the Old Testament, just like we do from the New Testament. And I encourage every Christian in this live stream to learn how to share the gospel from the Old Testament, because, you know, we're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. And there are some people who will yeah. reject the New Testament. And so it's really important for us to know how to do that. And if you don't know where to start, um, just look online. There are a lot of really great ministries that, um, you know, can be a resource to you in that way. But yeah, Jesus said we could know how to be saved from scripture alone. That's what those were his literal words. I know Catholics are big on the literal words of Jesus. So his literal yeah. words were search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. So we can know about Jesus from the Bible, not from the church fathers, not from tradition, from the Bible. Right. And we we don't. We don't need the church fathers, and even uh, in Acts, it, it talks about uh, after Paul and the apostles depart, who's going to come in? Ravenous wolves, not sparing the flock, <clears throat> and they're going to start teaching things that are not correct, and you can clearly see that that's a, that is what started to happen. All of these weird things coming up um in the early church, I mean, there was so many, so many heresies that that came up, and they're they're pulling these little quotes. It doesn't matter if it's out of context. Doesn't matter if you know you haven't read their other writings. You just pull this little piece out, like, oh, that looks like he supports Roman Catholic teaching. And I, I just run into that over and over and over again. And it, they, the early church really didn't uh, believe anything like modern Catholicism. If, if you read any of their writings, you, you can't see that. There's no uh, papal authority anywhere. I don't, I don't know where you find that. Um, they it was like not in Matthew 16. Where okay. Jesus founded the Catholic Church. Where are people getting that, that comment there? This is Jesus founded the Catholic Church. I, I don't understand Matthew, that. Matthew Catholic 16. Church was the first church. Like, mm -hmm. what? Peter wasn't even the pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. It was James the Less. It was one of Jesus' siblings, right? Yeah. Uh, Peter, yes, preached Pentecost. He's the one who mm -hmm. led the first people to the Lord as far as the new church, right? Like, the start of the Christian faith. He preached Pentecost and thousands of people get saved, right? But... He wasn't even the pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. He was an elder. He was looked to um, as a leader among the apostles, but he wasn't the pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. And so, you know, regardless, I mean, everything about the Catholic practice is rooted in pagan sorcery. Um, mm -hmm. The person in the chat who like was like, what college did you go to? And you must know Pastor B. Pastor B is my husband, which is probably <laughs> the 
why he talks about Catholicism a lot because he's married to an ex-Catholic who has explained to him how the Catholic Church is, with their doctrine, is sending millions of people to hell every year. So, you know, we're very passionate about helping people out of the Catholic Church. But, you know, like the Eucharist, transubstantiation, they take that from John 6, but I think it's hilarious because the majority of John 6 is about eternal security and about how salvation is by believing in Jesus. That's the majority of the chapter. The part about the Eucharist is at the very end, and it's very clear that Jesus doubles down on the metaphor of his body and blood because there were a lot of people there who were unbelieving, but were just following him because he was famous or because they had nothing else to do or whatever. They were curious, but they didn't really believe. And so yep. Jesus often told parables or gave answers to people that he knew would harden their hearts and turn them away because they didn't believe in him. And that's literally right. what the scripture says in John 6. So John 6 is not literal, just like many other passages of scripture are not literal. Jesus is not literally water, right? But he <laughs> says, I'm the living yeah. water. If you drink of me, you shall not thirst again. Like he's not water. You drink water at your service? No. Yeah. So, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. Remembrance. Why would you it's do it in remembrance if he's actually there? Like they believe. That this is actually right. him. Why do it in remembrance? Well, and here's the thing. They say they just bring down because the crucifixion happened outside of time, right? So it's just yeah. the sacrifice made present. We're not re-crucifying Jesus over and over again against Hebrews chapter 10, where it says we can't do that. Moses got punished for hitting the rock the second time. Jesus was crucified once, right? So they say, no, it's the sacrifice made present. But the problem with that is they take the leftover Eucharist and put it in the tabernacle because they believe it's still Jesus's body. So that's not just saying it's the sacrifice made present in the moment of the mass after the priest says his little incantation, right? The Eucharistic prayer. It's lit. They literally believe it's his body and they put the extra in the tabernacle and genuflect in front of it every time they pass it because it's Jesus's body. So they are re-crucifying him every week and they do believe they're literally eating his flesh and it's very pagan and it's sorcery and it, God literally forbids the drinking of blood in Deuteronomy 7, right. I believe, and in Acts chapter 15, mm -hmm. because the law, you know, they were, Peter confirmed with Paul that, you know, they're not supposed to be circumcising the Gentiles and all these other things, but they're still supposed to abstain from blood because drinking of blood was pagan sorcery. It was involved in the occult. It was not of God, had nothing to do with God. So why would God ever command you to drink blood? He would never do right. that period i think the catholic church is just satanic i'm sorry if that offends somebody and the uh, this I'm life not. but it it's just it's satanic the, I, yeah there i mean there's i think there's genuinely saved people within the catholic church um people so that why really are they still really in love it? god that's my question is why are they still in it they've been led astray by by the catholic church that they, they really like I believe, you know Emily Catholic converts. I believe she really loves God, and um, but like the that about her is it was her boyfriend because she grew up in a non-denominational church, but clearly oh, yeah. they didn't do a good job of teaching the Bible. So the moment a guy came around that she liked and wanted to be with, she forsook the faith that she was given, or at least they tried to give her. Um, yeah you know, for a relationship. And that happens a lot with young men and women um, who grow up maybe not not in a church that is strong on doctrine, right? This is why it's so important. Yeah. Who's your youth pastor? Who's your children's pastor? Children don't go to church to play. They can learn the scripture. It's like the most spiritual person in your church should be in charge of the children's ministry. It's not just for the random person who's willing to volunteer, right? Because like children, right. it is the most precious thing is teaching them God's word. And it's like, if you're not teaching them God's word, then they're easily led astray, you know, by a relationship or by other people. Cause that's what the Bible always says, like in Galatians and Ephesians and all that. Oh, foolish Galatians who hath bewitched you that you should, you know, not believe the truth anymore. Whatever. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like, yeah, it's always a person that leads you away. It's not, it's not and anything else. It's kind of sounded like, I mean, I I think I remember right. I talked to her a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> that she grew up in one of those non-denominational churches that are it's like a rock concert every week, 
and you know it's a really watered down message and you, you know what i'm talking about like i don't think she was getting what she needed and she wanted something more and so she found the catholic church and that was given her more yeah, that was because they do they reverence god would you yeah, really they say do. that like they really they do serious. you yeah. show up to mass dressed up like you yeah. don't act a fool your parents are on top of you and you like one time i tried to wear jeans to church and my mom was like get out of here go change <laughs> she was like no way you dressed up you were reverent it was yeah. a, it was a very time for your family so like they do they reverence god and like i said i think they're sincere they sincerely love god but they have no clue who god is because they're not taught the bible and that's mm -hmm. what i wanted to bring up earlier was that the church controls what scripture the people here right they have the liturgical cycles a b and c and so like cycle a is the gospel of matthew b is mark and c is luke and they only read from the gospel of john during holy times of the year like around christmas and easter and lent and advent and stuff so the church literally controls what parts of the bible you hear every week right. if you're not reading it wrong you're not hearing the whole bible and it repeats over and over and over again. It's just a cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, I, I don't know how to to pull people out of it other than doing things like this maybe. Um, it, it's hard because you, the church, like they have it set up in, in such a perfect way that if anybody says something against the church, it's automatically wrong. Even scripture, if it goes against the church, wrong. You, mm -hmm. you can't say anything against the church because, oh, it was, it was established on Peter. It's, it's infallible. You, you can't go against it. This is what's right. Um, and, yeah, it's, yeah. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, let's just throw out the scripture that says call no man father, like <laughs> in regards to religious leadership and authority, because you only have one father and it's God. Let's just throw out the scripture that says that you're not supposed to bring idols into your home or bow down to them in Deuteronomy. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's um, echoed <clears throat> in the new Testament. We're not supposed to bring idols into our home. And uh, when I was on a missions trip in Tijuana recently with our youth group, you know, I, I was able to meet this family. The, the young man already came to the church that we were out, you know, soul winning for, but I was speaking with the mother and she had an altar set up for her dead son with statues of Mary and, and all these other things that she was praying for his soul. And so, you know, I was able to try to talk to her, you know, about heaven and whatnot, but it's like, the church just re rejects clear commands of scripture for their tradition. And the moment you bring that scripture up, they, they've they always got an outside extra biblical source to pull from for why they do what they do. But mm -hmm. all scripture is given by inspiration of God, not early church fathers. not So, so people are allowed to be wrong, right? Romans 3, 4, let God be true, but every man a liar. Yeah. yeah. Right? They are a lot like um, the Pharisees, you know. That Just say, prove tradition. it. Prove I'm wrong. Prove I'm wrong. Tell me uh, that people don't have statues of Mary and statues of saints in their home that they oh, set yeah. up all to to pray their novenas. You you could Tell go pull up pictures right I'm now of Catholics kissing the statue of Mary. When I was in school, I don't know if you ever did this with your church, but when I was in school. We, um, it was St. Joan of Arc Catholic Church, uh, or Catholic School, sorry. If they had a church, but it was the school. So St. Joan of Arc Catholic School in Laplace, Louisiana. And they paraded the whole school out into this courtyard. Like we had a field and it was a courtyard. And in this grove of trees was a massive statue of Mary. And so for her feast day, for the Immaculate Conception, we'd go out there and parade out to the statue, bringing flowers. We would crown her with flowers and place flowers at her feet. And we would pray and sing to Mary. Yeah. But that's wow. not. That, uh, oh, that's wait. Not that's that's veneration. That's not worship. It's well, veneration. I'm an English teacher. And if you want to get your thesaurus out, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, 
what kind of what kind of uh, dessert do thesauruses eat? Synonym rolls. <laughs> anyway, um, it's like a stupid teacher joke. But you get your thesaurus out, and what is a synonym of worship? Adoration and veneration. Those are reserved for right. God alone. God alone. Period. Point blank. Yep. Period. I got a question for you, Megan. Ooh, fun. Where did they get purgatory? Where, where is that? Why is that a thing? So, are you familiar with the Bema seat, like the judgment seat of Christ? Are you familiar with that doctrine? Yeah. So the scripture that talks about that is, I believe, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. That's like one of the main ones. There's a few they pull from, but they're all about the judgment seat of Christ. So Christians, we never answer for our sin. If we're saved, right? I don't know if you would agree with this, Jordan, but like we never answer for our sin. We answer to God for our service. God will judge our service, whether yeah. or not a pure motive for him. You know, if we were doing it to be seen of men, it's going to burn up. Right. And so that's when that right. scripture is, saying, but they'll be saved as by fire. So like my life will be saved. My I'm still in heaven if I'm saved. Right. But if I did my service for the Lord so that men would see me and praise me or I'd have a good name in the community and I wasn't doing it out of a pure heart for the Lord, uh, the Bible says that those uh, works are going to be burnt up and I'm not going to receive any rewards for them in heaven. And all those rewards we cast at Jesus' feet anyway, they're not ours. They're yeah. God's, <laughs> right? right. It's, it's hilarious. It's not us that does it. It's God that does it through us. So any reward we get in heaven gets cast at the feet of Jesus. So it's like not even a thing, but they take the doctrine of the judgment seat of Christ and they made it into this whole thing of purgatory. And I think purgatory is really only found in the Apocrypha or as they would call it, the Deuterocanon. Um, but I don't call it yep. that because it's not canon. The writers of it never claimed it was canon. They are historical reference books, but they are not scripture. They are not God breathed. And they were added. They were added to scripture later by the Catholic church um, in the council uh, Trent? Um, no, not, uh, no, it was earlier than that. So after Nicaea, it was like the first main council where you see the actual Roman Catholic Church, the political structure of the Roman Catholic Church really taking form and trying to control the narrative. Because like Nicaea, you still had believers there. There's nothing wrong with the Nicaean Creed. I mean, it's, it's good doctrine. Yeah. To say that that was the Roman Catholic Church then, that's not true historically. But like I said, it's just Roman Catholic propaganda. So it's in the Apocrypha. And um, and then they twist scriptures about the judgment seat of Christ to be about purgatory. But that's not what they're about at all. Yeah, it's another uh, eisegesis moment where they're reading stuff in that they've, they've taken from uh, the Roman Catholic Church teachings. They just read it back into the scripture. It was never there to begin with. <clears throat> and I think they get... Uh, Praying to the saints from the Apocrypha 2, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that was the other one that they get from there. Um, I know yeah. the only thing that I believed when I was younger was that mm -hmm. if I'm not going to heaven, I'll go to purgatory. And it's the waiting room is what I was taught. Mm -hmm. That's the waiting room for heaven. And so if I'm not going to heaven right away, I'm going to go to purgatory. <laughs> That's what I was like <laughs> believing my entire like childhood and up until like seventh grade. Seriously. Well, the whole thing about mortal and venial sin, right? So James 2.10 says, if you break one facet of the law, you've broken the whole thing. So scripture is clear that there is no such thing as like a worse sin than any other sin. In God's eyes, all sin is equal. You know, if you've told a lie, you're a murderer. Okay. Like it's, it's all lumped in together. And so, you know, if you die with venial sins on your soul, then you have to be purged of those in purgatory before you can enter heaven because sin can't be in heaven, right? So that's also where they get the whole idea of purgatory, that if you die with this sin on your soul, um, then you have to still be purified. But they're rejecting the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ, which is the big fancy word for Jesus paid it all. All to him yeah. I owe. There's nothing I can do to make myself clean. I, I don't want to pay for my own sins because if I'm paying for my own sins, that's in hell for eternity. Yeah, Those you can't do it. You're saved or you're lost. There is no in-between. So. You, you can't, uh, you can't, like, it's so sad. You, you cannot work for your salvation. And I know some some Catholics will say, well, we're not, we're, we, we actually believe in, uh, you know, 
being saved by you know believing in Jesus. But you could lose that, and then to work it back to gain grace, you gotta do all the sacraments. They believe and, in baptismal regeneration, which that's yeah. disproven in Acts ten forty four to forty eight. So like water baptism does nothing for you, period. Like nothing. There's one gospel according to Ephesians. There's one gospel, one Lord, all the other stuff. So if there's only one way to be saved. And if anybody gets saved in the Bible without being water baptized, then no one is saved by water baptism, right? So if you go to Acts 10, verses 44 to 48, they receive, the people hear the preaching, they get saved, and they receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost, right? And they start speaking in tongues. Yep. And Peter's astonished because he's like, they're Gentiles, right? Like, what's happening? The Jews just couldn't believe that the Gentiles were getting saved because they were snobs and thought that the gospel was only for them. But mm -hmm. Paul had to come along and say, the gospel's for everybody because you stink <laughs> at evangelism. And he, I'm here to like, let them know that God's here to save them too. Right. So anyway, um, if they get saved without water baptism, then everybody gets saved without water baptism. So Catholics do believe in baptismal regeneration. They believe that infant baptism washes away original sin. Um, yep. But that's unnecessary because the Bible's clear that all children go to heaven. David, when his son with Bathsheba died, he stopped yeah. mourning because he says, he will not come to me, but I will go to him. He was acknowledging that he would see his son again in heaven. And there's a few other passages that we can look to, but all children go to heaven. God, God doesn't send any child to hell, period. So right. yeah. I have read the catechism to everybody in the comments that's late. We've both been fully catechized and grew up in Catholic church. Like I was confirmed, my patron saint name like my cat my my confirmation name was cecilia because she was the patron saint of music i don't know if you I remember yours, was Anne. what was it and Anne, Anne. i think yeah i i don't even, i had no idea what it even meant they're just like go ahead and pick a name i'm like i, I don't know i think they found us <laughs> they're here now in mass <laughs> yeah it's just really it's really sad that they they think they have to do all these things to keep on being saved um, yeah and i'm what, still trying to words? kind of break from that too that mentality yeah. like even my mom like she tries to break from that like we it's it's so ingrained into us like i literally thought this is what i think it was from what bruce almighty but this is how i literally thought of god that he is a kid on an anthill or whatever, burning people with a magnifying glass if someone ever did anything wrong. And so that's my, that was my thought the entire time. Like, I'm just like, I got to be so good or he's mm -hmm. going to strike me down. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's the, I forget where it is. Um, I think Romans. Um, if it's by works, it's no longer grace. So is that like, you can't have both. Four? You can't. Romans four. I think it's I, four. I forget where it is. It's four or six, but it's a good passage, right? Because if it's of faith, yeah. then it's no more of works. But if it's of wor works, then it's no more grace or something like that, right? Yeah. So yeah. you can't have both. And we are talked about James that faith without works is dead is literally talking about like it literally says in James, though a man may say, in the eyes of men. They look at a person who claims to be saved, but doesn't live like it, and they don't believe it. Because you're not you're justified in the eyes of men by the outward appearance. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart, and we're saved by confessing with our mouth the belief of our heart. That's Romans 10. We're not saved by the opinion of men. We're saved by God. <laughs> we're saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of yeah. Jesus Christ and putting our faith in that. Um mm -hmm. You know, the gospel is yeah, just... Yeah, James is only talking about the, the works are evidence of your faith. That is true and faith. Catholic militant, I'm a grown woman, so you could respect me and not call me girly, for one. But two, <laughs> faith is not a work. Calling upon the name of the Lord is not a work. God very clearly yeah. juxtaposes the two in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. He says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So faith and works are opposites in the in the eyes of God. So you can say, well, it's an action verb, blah, blah, blah. That's man's logic. God says faith is not a work. Therefore, it's not. You don't know better than God. 
So, yeah. Yeah, and are, are they saying that the Bible contradicts itself then? If, if and James says, well, we're saved uh, with faith plus works, but you know, everywhere else, it's, it's just faith. So they kind of have to say, well, I want. Well, I know they got workarounds for it, but they they really are saying that there's a contradiction here in the Bible and the God breathed scriptures. Um, so I have a big problem with that. And there's also different, like justified doesn't always mean the same thing. Um, there's, there's like saved doesn't always mean the same thing. Like you could be saved like in terms of your eternal uh, life, or, you know, you could be saved from some trouble that's happening. Um, there, like Matthew and, 24, when it's talking about the end times, right? Yeah. Like, if we endure to the end, then we'll be saved. That's literally talking about our life being saved if we make it to the end of the tribulation. Like, I'm not going to yeah. get into eschatology tonight, but it's talking about people <laughs> who are living during the tribulation, that their yeah. life is literally saved. So saved, it doesn't always mean, like you said, like justification the regeneration of your soul being born again. Um, but the context of the passage will give that to you. So like you said, Jordan, yep. um, what the Catholic church does is they eisegete their doctrine into the scripture and they've gotten better at their language to keep people in the church. See, when I was young and yeah. I don't know if you would say the same thing, they were a lot more open about the fact that they believe that if you're not Catholic, you're not saved, that there is no salvation outside the sacraments they were very clear that obedience to religious ritual is how you receive the grace of God. There wasn't any of this, you're saved by faith in Jesus. Like I never heard that once in my life growing up. Um, but they're getting better at saying that because now that people actually read their Bibles and people are using technology to reach more people with the truth, they've got to, they've got to keep their hold on people somehow. So they're better at, they're better at twisting their words to make it seem like they agree with the Bible, but they really don't. Right. I've never and even for, heard the term being saved. That that was the yeah. thing. Like in Catholic Church, I never even heard the term saved, you know, by the blood of Christ. Christ. Never heard that. Like, what does it mean to be born again? Sanctified. Yeah. Like those words. Never heard of it. Yeah, and for the uh the James two people, I just want to give you there's there's two definitions here for justified. The first one is having done uh for or marked by a good or legitimate reason and then the second one is declared or made righteous in the sight of god so make sure in that that passage you're reading you're reading the right justified because justified doesn't always mean made righteous there, there's different definitions for that and i i get i get james too in my comments all the time and like you're not reading i don't think you're reading the rest of the the chapter or even the book they're not because the church controls what scriptures they hear and the thing about the ones that are on tiktok like these catholics that are on tiktok that are like fully indoctrinated i mean they're i don't know so most of them i feel like they're practically reprobate at this point because they are they're no different than the muslims that come in and want to say oh you know there's 40 diff 40,000 different Protestant denominations. Actually, that's not true. There's a few different major categories and individual churches are going to be different because most of these churches are independent. They're not part of a convention. But to say that every Catholic church is exactly the same is completely ludicrous because just from yeah. hearing what he said from her Catholic church and knowing what I grew up with, our churches sound completely different. <laughs> So the Catholic Church can claim uniformity, but it, it's really up to the priest. What does the preach, priest teach in his homilies? Um, did you grow up in Catholic school or not? Because if your church had a school, then often it was more academic and philosophical than it was biblical. I learned a lot of philosophy. I studied um, Augustine. I studied um, early church fathers and stuff like that and, and philosophy and, and whatnot. And that was emphasized more than the actual scripture. Like I was never required to read the Bible for any school assignment. Um, I never had a priest encourage us to read the Bible on our own. I'm just telling you what I grew up in my entire life. I went to mass every week, baptized first confession, first communion. And I was confirmed at the age of 17. So I went through a whole process. Yeah. 
And I'm just I gotta ask you, you, Megan, what was your uh, confession yep. for reconciliation? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. What was your first confession for reconciliation? Like when you did reconciliation, what was your confession? Mm -hmm. I don't even. I don't even remember. Honestly, I, I felt like most times when I went to confession, I felt like I had to make stuff up because I didn't sound bad enough. Like if I had a good week, you know, um, I thought, I thought bad thoughts about my sister. You know, I didn't, I didn't clean up my room the second my mom told me to, you know, like I had to like make up stuff when I was a kid. I remember doing that. Um, and I was never afraid. Like, you know how you could choose to kneel and have the divider between you or go sit in the chair and look at him face to face? I'd always sit in the chair and like look at him face to face. I'm like, I'm I didn't have that option. Man. Oh, yeah. I'm like, I'm going to have a conversation <laughs> with this man. You know, like, here we are. I'm not ashamed. Like, let's talk about it. So anyway, it was just funny. Mine was, uh, I stole quarters from my mom's purse. So... <laughs> Oh. I do not remember what the priest hey. told me to say after hey. that, like five help Marys, our fathers or whatever. Like, I don't remember. Did you notice that they would have you say way more hail Marys than our fathers? Mm hmm. Like, yeah, the hail didn't either. They didn't count for as much or they were more important than the our father. I don't know. But I'd always have like 10 hail Marys and then like two our fathers or something like that. You know, I'm like, why do I have to say more Hail Marys? And why is the, ro you know, the rosary, right? It's basically all Hail Marys after you say the creeds and the few Our Fathers. And it's like Hail Mary the whole way around. Um, yeah. I don't yeah what's, know what's that supposed to do for you? That? The rosary? Any of them. Hail Marys, Our Fathers. What are, they, what are they supposed to do for you? Well, they, that's your penance, right? Not by oh, works yeah. of right that I have done but by his mercy he saved us so literally that was our penance for our sins which is also against scripture because it's Jesus who pays the price for our sin it's the shedding of his blood right without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins your sins cannot be forgiven or paid for by a prayer like an our father right. or a hail Mary. not what scripture says right calling upon the name of the Lord you know you're saying oh the sinner's prayer isn't in scripture some people are commenting that well what do you call what the thief on the cross did Lord Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Your God, yep. take me to heaven when I die. That was the sinner's prayer. That's, and he was saved. Today you'll be with me in paradise, right? So the thief yep. on the cross got to go to heaven. Listen, I know you're not asking Mary to pay for your sins, but saying the Hail Mary is the penance for your sins, it's the punishment for your sins. See, they don't listen. It's like, the yeah. natural man receives not the things of God. They just can't, they can't grasp it somehow. And he you said, know, ask, ask for Mary's intercession for us to God. The um, fact that they think that they can even ask her, she yeah. she's dead, guys. They're, they're dead. The saints are dead. They can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hebrews, Hebrews says that um, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he is always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is the one who makes intercession for us, not Mary. Yeah. And have you noticed that Mary is kind of like taking over the offices of Jesus? Mm -hmm. have, you, have you noticed? Stephen Stowell read on one of his videos mm -hmm. a novena to Mary. It's one of the novenas. And it literally gives all of the attributes of Jesus as the Messiah and, and God to Mary. And there's a video of Pope Francis when he's praying for the people of Rome to Mary. He literally says that she's the savior of all the citizens of Rome. Mary's yeah, the savior. Just, and it's, it's this it's is a blasphemous. video. This is, it's not taken out of context and it's got the subtitles, but I speak Italian. I know enough Italian. I knew what he was saying. And it's exactly what the subtitles were saying. So it wasn't edited. It wasn't changed. This was a video of Pope Francis basically saying that Mary was the savior of the people of Rome. He's the yeah, Pope. That's just He's the vicar crazy. of Christ. He is supposed to be Christ's representative in the world. He's basically supposed to be almost equal to Christ, but he's a heretic. Can, I'm sorry. Can the Pope, Pope is heretic? definitely the false prophet. Just... Can he be a heretic? Can heretics speak ex-cathedra? What's up, girl? Hi, Ashley. Anyway. 
it's just it just blew my mind like it's so obvious what's happening but they just over and over again will reject and it breaks my heart because i'm like guys i know you love god i know you believe the bible's yeah. god's word but can't you see what they're doing is so wrong I can't you just admit it it's okay my family honestly they disowned me for three years when i got saved they didn't want to have anything to do with me wow it's basically a cult i was disfellowshipped like you know how the jehovah's witnesses will like basically pretend like you never existed if you leave that's how the yeah. catholic my catholic family was they didn't have anything to do with me for several years now eventually i was able to build a relationship with them again and i've led my parents to the lord which is awesome um it's amazing but, you know, I still have a lot of unsaved family, but I have a good relationship with them. And so there's hope and I'm still praying. Right. But it's like, yeah. you know, they want to say that we're cultists, but they're the ones who will literally support it no matter how many times they're shown to be pagan and sorcery and blasphemous. And just the church right. is doctrines of devils. First Timothy four, one through four literally says that abstaining from meats and forbidding to marry are doctrines of devils. We just got finished with Lent and they forbid their priests to marry. It's a doctrine yep. of devils. <laughs> the bishop to be the husband of one wife. And when you fast, you're supposed to do it in secret. Nobody's supposed to know about it. So every exactly. Friday, everybody knows, oh, the Catholics are at McDonald's getting their filet of fish. You know, like <laughs> it, that's not what biblical fasting is, right? Right. I remember those days. Oh my gosh. 